I have the award winning now. You just got honored. <laughs> Lee Zeidman, president of Staples. I had to come back and have this interview because out of anyone in the sports industry, I thought you could give me the real insight on the changes that have occurred in sports itself, especially as you know, the leader in indoor facilities, uh, as you said, the first to close and the last to open. Um, I want to ask you one question. What were you thinking? I think it was around March 17th when the NBA closed down. What was, you know, after all the years in the industry, what was the first thought that went through your head? Well, we actually had a game March 12th, a Kings game against the Ottawa Senators. And that was the last live event until obviously we came back without fans and with fans um, uh, beginning April 15th. But when we shut down after that game, I took close to 3,000 employees from Staples Center over to Microsoft Theater, because I oversee Microsoft Theater and LA Live as well, and we put them in the orchestra level there, and I addressed them, and I said, listen, I don't know where we're going, I don't know what this means, I don't know if it's gonna be three weeks, it's gonna be three months, if it's gonna be 15 months, um, I have no idea, but I will promise you this, that we will keep you apprised of what's going on, and we will figure this out together. We will give you work as much as possible, we'll work with our tenants, the Clippers, the Lakers, and the Kings, the NBA, the NHL, and AEG to make sure that we keep you all apprised. At that time, David, nobody knew how long it was going to be. I mean, you know, you, you sat there and you thought, this can't go more than three weeks. They can't shut down the NBA and the NHL, concerts and everything else without moving forward. And uh, so we were just kind of in a waiting game those first few weeks. And then once, you know, me personally, once I realized that we're not coming back for a while, and then once I realized professionally we're not coming back for an even longer while, then you started to pivot and try to and started to plan on what you were going to do. And for you, I know you. Your primary interest is probably your people, and you know, not knowing about three thousand lives, three thousand families, after someone who's built his career on caring about other people more than yourself or more than the business. It's really you're a people person. What were some of the strategies that you utilized in order to support all those employees that you have from all those different organizations and different leagues? Well, the first thing I did was, and, and we did as a company, we, got, we, we uh, engaged with the Los Angeles Lakers, Clippers, and the Kings. And we said, listen, you know, what do you want to do? There are some right things to do, some wrong things to do. But we were way out in front of a lot of the other organizations. And in April of 2020, we came up with a plan that we were going to pay all of our part-time employees through the end of the NBA and the NHL seasons. Um, obviously, playoffs were never guaranteed as it relates to part-time work, so we decided that we were going to do that for them. And then on the flip side of that, you know, we were going to still need to keep the venues operating. We were going to need to secure them. We were going to need to operate them from an engineering standpoint, from a maintenance standpoint, and an operation standpoint. So we got with our unions and we said, listen, you know, we're going to need some concessions. Um, we're not looking to, to, you know, cut pay. We're not looking to cut hours, but we're going to need some working conditions that's going to help us get through this and all the unions stepped up and we had a great relationship with them and so we kept quite a few employees working throughout the entire pandemic to make sure that our facilities were ready to go once we got the okay to do things and on the flip side of that as well you know we needed to prepare the venues on on to how we were going to come out of this so first and foremost a lot of these employees the 3,000 part-time employees that we had you know for some it was their only paycheck for others it could be their second or third job and you know we were doing two 250 events a year in this building and then another 120 at Microsoft Theater and then about you know three four hundred events at LA Live so that's a lot of part-time work so first and foremost we wanted to make sure we got them through the end of the seasons because nothing else was guaranteed so we made sure through our partnerships with the Lakers Clippers and Kings and AEG to get that done keeping promises are obviously important to you as you kept those promises through the end of the season you have an extreme background from early days of booking talent you know, you're a perfect fit for what you do today and everything is an evolution, not a revolution when it comes to our career. I always say, if you connected Lee Zeidman's career, if you connect the dots backwards, we you know, have these young fans of yours here saying, how do you become a president of, of the Staples Center and all this? I said, well, if you connect the dots backwards, no one would believe the story. And yet you utilize, I bet, from Taco Bell all the way to the honors that you get today for being a great leader in the sports community and from facilities management, booking talent, you know, just understanding the human resource side of things. What capabilities did you draw upon from that connecting the dots of your career to this great position you hold? What were some of the capabilities that you drew upon and what part of your life 
was most valuable. You know, I'm sure like me, there's some things that nobody would think of that you learned early on that now were applicable because of the pandemic and the quick change in circumstances. Well, I, I knew early on, I, well, first of all, I always loved sports and entertainment. You know, I played college football, college baseball. Um, I was, you know, I wanted to be a professional baseball player, but there wasn't a, a big market for a 150-pound banjo-hitting first baseman, you know, moving <laughs> forward. So I knew that that was never going to get me anywhere. So uh, I kind of got, uh, I started booking concerts and I kind of fell into this. You know, back then there were no sports management degrees that you can get, you know, all across the country now. And so I've kind of, I got lucky and then I worked hard. And, you know, as I talk to younger students, um, younger professionals nowadays, you know, I, I'm a big proponent of inter inter uh, informational interviews. And so I tell people, you need to get with the people that you want to get into their business or their organization and sit down with them. doesn't mean you're asking them for a job, but learn what they have done to get to that point in their career. And I give out informational interviews probably two, three times a week. And I get an opportunity to speak to young people at, at various you know campuses around Southern California. And I, I, I give my card out or I give my information out and I set up these interviews with them to just try to impart some of the things that I've gone through. That's the first thing. The second thing is, uh, you know, I, I believe in, you know, once you figure out where you want to go, once you get into that organization, you need to become a sponge and suck up as much knowledge as you can about that organization. Because if you're anything like us, and I may have told you this before, you know, we'll promote from within. And so I'm looking for people who understand more than just sales or PR or marketing or booking or operations or event coordination or event management. I'm looking for well-rounded people, you know, to bring into our organization to help uplift the organization. But for me, I think it was, you know, I realized that, that you know, nobody was going to give me a $100,000 job, you know, coming right out of college, you know, back then. I realized that it was going to take a lot of hard work. And, you know, I, I looked for those inter informational interviews. And then once I did get into an organization, I made sure I learned everything about it and all the people and sucked up all that knowledge. And I was there when people were looking to make the promotions. And I was readily available in terms of imparting the things and the skills that I've learned over the time. So I'm a big fan of meeting with as many people as you possibly can. One of the other things that I've learned through you, watching you, speaking with you, is the concept of illumination and humility. Uh, you're really good at, you know, just illuminate, you talk about getting ahead of everything, meeting with the Lakers, the Kings, et cetera, early on, illuminating to your own employees what the issues are. But there's a, you know, a matter of humility that uh, comes about that you're okay to share the experiences that may not be perfect in the world and you have very little ego when it seems to you know plan events and I'm sure you know canceling 200 and some events here 100 and some events over there knowing coming from the talent side of things as an agent there's some huge egos and a lot of resistance uh, and you seem I couldn't even imagine as I was walking into this interview what it'd be like to talk to all those managers, agents, talent, and what their expectations were, and yet you haven't even brought it up, and you must have come out with this humility. Uh, what technique in negotiation, when you have this many egos to deal with, what have you found to be the best technique or best strategy or philosophy that you've had to handle so many egos over the years, and especially during the pandemic? I, you needed to be educated. And, and so I, you know, over these last 15 months, I made sure that I was educated. On, no, I'm not talking about the science and the data and, and all that other <laughs> stuff, although I have read about that and I've learned a lot about that. But I realized early on that, that you know, the state of California, the public health uh, department there, the county of Los Angeles, um, Department of Public Health, they don't understand our industry, nor are they really concerned about it in the very beginning. They were more about flattening the curve, uh, keeping the hospitals from being overrun with COVID patients, making sure the frontline healthcare workers are safe and protected, contact tracing, and then eventually needles in arms. And so I need to make sure that I was educated on everything that they were working on, A, and then B, I needed to educate them on how we work as an industry, from putting on a concert to putting on a sporting event to booking a show to having 20,000 people come into your venues. I needed them to understand that because at some point I knew they were going to put out guidelines and protocols 
in order for us to be able to operate again. First fanless back in December, and then uh, with fans back uh, April 15th, just recently. So I needed to get educated from what they were all working on, and then I needed to educate them and help them write the protocols and the guidelines. And how that helped me in dealing with all the egos and the teams and the leagues and the, and the various agents and artists and managers was, I could tell them this is what I think. I think we're going to open up here, or I think these are the guidelines we're going to be facing, or the protocols that we're going to need to adhere to, be it mask wearing, or looking for vax cards, or looking for tests before you can come in the venues. So I made sure that, that every call that I took and every negotiation I was in, and any time I was talking to an agent uh, or the NBA or the NHL, that I am part of that knowledge because I was dialed into the county and to the state based on the conversations I had and the fact that I needed to educate them on how our organizations worked and how the industry worked because they had no idea. And speaking of no idea, no matter how much we learn, how experienced we are, how much success we've had, you know, as I get older and older, and I'm sure we've shared this together, right? We don't know what we don't know. And I see 2020 especially as a year of reflection and seasoned vets and successful people like yourself uh, you know, that kids will come here to see the legend of Lee. We learn something that either we thought we knew or we learned something you know, about ourselves. What did you learn during this period of reflection, either about yourself personally or about your business that you're, you know, supposedly the legend and the expert at? What were some of the things that, you know, you're like, wow, I really didn't know what I didn't know? Well, I'll be honest with you, you know, when this first hit, you know, I was a guy that worked 100 hour work weeks, you know, there were no weekends or holidays in our business, you know, it was all predicated on events taking place. You know, we used to tell people when, when you're playing, we're working because this is what, this is what people do for entertainment from the sports and entertainment industry. And so I needed to figure out, wow, you know, I'm, I'm not going into 5.30 to grab a workout here at Staples Center. I'm not staying till nine o'clock at night to see Luke Bryan on stage or the Lakers playing the Clippers or any of the other, you know, numerous events that we did. So what am I, can I do that? And, you know, I realized that, you know, I could probably burn myself up or out if I didn't adapt. And I needed to be flexible and I needed to adapt personally because, like I said, 100 hour work weeks, I'd be at six, seven times a, a week almost with events and everything like that for eight, nine months. So I had to realize that from the very beginning. And then I had to figure out how to work smarter, not harder. I, did, I don't need to be here 16 hours. I got a great team. I, got a, I have people that have been with me for 16, 17 years now. And, you know, it's time for them to, you know, take the ball and run with it. You know what I mean? I don't need to be that guy. I don't need all the adulation. I don't, I don't need all the, the awards or anything like that. I'm, I'm going to be 66 years old in, on July 4th. And you know what? I've seen it. I've done it. I've participated in it. I've been part of it. I've been fortunate enough to be with good teams, good owners, and things of that nature. And then living in downtown Los Angeles, or working in downtown Los Angeles, and living out in Venice Beach. So I had to, I had to kind of reinvent myself and just take it slow and be flexible and, and adapt to what it's at because this is a pandemic. You know, it's not gonna it's not gonna stop because Lee Zeidman wants to come back and do a Laker game, or <laughs> Lee Zeidman wants to do uh, you know uh, 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 Lady John Gaga, concert. Lady Gaga, or an Elton John concert. It's not gonna happen. And so I needed to learn that, or else I would have drove myself crazy and my significant other she would have been driven crazy too because you know this was the first time we've actually spent 24 7 with each other and when she wanted to see me a lot she used to come down here to take it into a, an event with her girlfriends and things of that nature so i had to change everything personally and then i had to rethink professionally because i knew at a certain point we're not coming back for a long time and i needed to kind of impart some of that knowledge on my team because my team was anxious to get back here. They wanted to get back here. And you know, a lot of these were young kids too. And again, older professionals who've been with me a long time, but they were ready to get back into the, get, get back into the trenches and do these things. And I had to slow them down because this is gonna take some time. So let's take our time and do a couple things. Let's reinvent the fan experience. Let's change the dynamics of our venues. And let's think about the protocols so we can help county health, the state health, so we can open up quicker. And you, as much as 2020 is the year of reflection, I see 2021 is the year of decisions. And you know, as much as we've had to make decisions so far, getting to halfway through the year, with everything opening back up, 
and we anticipate that by July we can have 100% occupancy uh, at some of these events, if not all of them. What are some of the tougher decisions that other people may not even think are there that you have to make coming into the second half of 2021? Well, I think first and foremost you had to you had to redefine your organization. You know, there were a lot of layoffs, furloughs terminations, restructuring, you know, those were done April, May, June of last year, you know, so we had to, we had to rethink who we were going to be during this pandemic. And unfortunately, some people lost their positions. Other people were furloughed. Fortunately, I work for a, a great ownership group and um, we've been able to bring everybody back from furlough who was available to come back because some of these people found other employment. And so now we're ramping back up again because now as we slowly start to open back up, you know, we see the need to bring all these people People back a so we can do get back to where we were before so I think that was the first thing to understand that and put the organization in place moving forward and once you have the organization in place as it related to what you were doing during the pandemic then you can gear up for post pandemic some of the decisions now are really are really challenging because of the condensed calendar and so we're trying to squeeze in you know the NBA the NHL the WNBA all these concerts that needed to be rescheduled you know a lot of these award shows as you see the Billboard Music Awards outside now getting ready for May 23rd so we had to rethink how we're booking everything and then you know getting the commitments from everybody to move to the certain dates was tough the NBA didn't know when they were going to start up again the NHL didn't know when they were going to start up again the concert would move and then they'd have to move again because nobody knew when we were going to be able to fully open up. So I think first and foremost, it was getting your team back in place and your organization ready to go. Then it was working on your calendar in this industry and how you're going to book things and working with the tenants and the leagues. And then the third thing is getting the venue ready to accept everybody. Last question. Uh, one of the things that I learned as I reflect from my experience in sports and sports business and the sports industry is how much waste uh, I had expense wise and it wasn't just overhead of employees there was so many things while traveling the amount of people that were involved in different things I was doing from the sports market uh, marketing to the agentry to the uh, representation uh, just so many different areas I'm looking at your massive empire here and the greatest sports city in the in the country if not the world and I was just amazed that it just didn't get devastated. You know, I'm in my mathematical business mind, I'm thinking, how are they still open? How are they gonna make it through the pandemic? And, you know, looking at it, what was the economic effect? And it can, you know, not only exact numbers percentage wise, or, you know, what was that effect and how did you guys stay open and viable when there was, you know, such a long period of time? And this stuff cannot be cheap to keep open. No, it's not cheap to keep over. <laughs> and trust me, we have a great owner in, in Mr. Phil Anschutz. So, I mean, he's, he's, he's phenomenal as it relates to allowing Dan Beckerman, our CEO, and, and Rob Reed, our CFO, to get us to where we needed to get to. But we had to rethink about every expenditure going out there because you have to understand this building and this campus does very well. I mean, it obviously, in my opinion, revitalized downtown Los Angeles no doubt. back when Staples Center opened up and then when LA Live opened up, you know, a good 10, 11 years after that. But come March 13th, 2020, boom, there was no revenue coming in, zero coming in. So we had to tighten our belts and we were looking at doing a major renovation for the building um, in conjunction with a lot of other things that were going on down here. We put a lot of things on hold and we got to the point to where we needed to do what we had to do, A, to maintain it, and then I needed to put together a plan with my team on what we needed to do and what kind of money we needed to spend to be ready when we fully opened up again. So it was a two prong approach. But the first thing was tightening those belts and, and not spending on anything that needed to, to be spent on. It was a maintenance mode. And then it was a, all right, what do we need to do and spend to get ready? You know, we went cashless, we went touchless, we went contactless. You know, we did improvements for people to come back to be, you know, six feet distancing in the offices, things of that nature. So we did a lot of those things that got blessed from upper management, from ownership, as related to what we needed to do to get ready, because no one ever knew when we were going to get the go-ahead to go. But, um, you know, I have 17 restaurants across the street. Four of them are not going to come back. Um, so we're actively seeking out new restaurant partners. Um, four of them have stayed open throughout the entire 15 months and have been great partners. And, you know, 25% here, indoors and no indoors and 25% outdoors, then takeout only, and they've stuck it out. But there have been four that, that just couldn't bear it and couldn't stay, and so we're now we're looking to replace those. And I think the last thing 
that, that has really been challenging to a certain extent is, you know, you've got to get all those employees ramped up again. All those 3,000 part-time employees, get them ready, get their mindset. You've got to train them in new COVID-related uh, policies and procedures, how to deal with that, how to deal with mask mandates, how to deal with vax cards, how to deal with, you know, paperwork as it relates to getting shots, um, as it relates to, you know, getting tested, things of that nature, and ensure to that uh, workforce that we're safe and we're ready to go that you coming back out of your home and coming back to work are not going to be in peril to get COVID because we have done everything possible to do that so there have been quite a few things that you know people say well, what do you what have you done for 15 months there's a lot we've done you know there's a lot we've done but you know we've hosted over 120 events here at Staples Center since since just right before Christmas. And, you know, yes, a lot of them were without fans. And now we're bringing back fans. Last night at the Laker game, the last home game, we had just under 4,000 where they unveiled the banner, uh, which was a great opportunity for the fans to see that. And then I believe in the playoffs moving forward, we'll be at least 7,000, 7,500 moving forward because we're in the yellow tier right now. And then I hope uh, June 15th that when the governor says we're 100%, that we'll have 18 to 20,000 people back here. I just don't know if we're gonna to have to look at your vax card or proof of a test coming in, which will slow our, our process down a little bit, but we're close and it's all about needles and arms. And you know, we're doing vaccinations on site for our employees right now, those who haven't been able to get out there to get it, we partnered up with the county. So I'm very optimistic that we're headed in the right direction and that by the end of the summer, we're, we're really back in full swing. And then it's dealing with, all right, how do we squeeze this in here, squeeze that in here and squeeze that in there. What's the, one lesson tell our grandkids about the pandemic? I, I think that, I, I think that, you know, first of all, it's not going to be the last pandemic. Yeah. So, so, <laughs> so I, I would hope that that who is ever in charge of our federal government does a better job in, in preparing us for the next pandemic. But I think that the lesson to be learned here is that you need to you need to be able to adapt and you need to be flexible, because it's one thing that I learned early on is that we have no idea when it's going to end. We have no idea how long it's how, how long it's going to have certain protocols or guidelines there. So you have to be flexible and you have to adapt and you also have to understand that not everybody is not everybody is are the old dogs like you and I of which they can learn new tricks old dogs like us but you know there are a lot of you know I listen to a lot of our younger people our younger staff that that maybe had young kids that were living in a two-bedroom apartment that now had the kids thrust upon them and it was a whole different work environment for them they could never be away from the kids because the kids weren't in school so one thing I did learn was I learned about all the all the various stories and demographics of the people who worked for us and the different situations they were in you know not everybody had a David or Lee experience moving forward and I try to preface that when I tell people people that I, I, I got through this because of the certain things that I did and, and where I was. But, you know, guys like you and I worked our butts off to get to this level, too. And so I try to tell people that just because we're in a pandemic or, or we're coming out of one, that doesn't mean you should stop working during that period of time. You should adapt and become flexible because there's going to be another pandemic. Absolutely. Never undervalue a hug. Always throw away your candy before the pandemic starts. <laughs> so no one's eating it. Refresh it. <laughs> refresh it. I sat there in my <laughs> office and people would come in every now and then and they'd take some of that. I'd say, you know, that's 15 months old. That they candy. still eat it. I can't <laughs> guarantee what that Twix piece of candy tastes like when you bite into it. But I guarantee you it's not going to be a crunch. <laughs> exactly. Twinkies have a billion year half life. So Twinkies will stay safe through the pandemic. The lesson I've learned. Anyway, what a pleasure it always is. The incredible Lee Zeidman, president of Staples Center, here with David Meltzer entrepreneurs the playbook